being a part of this family and the platform that comes with that is an incredible responsibility that I take really seriously. Drama, controversy, reconciliation. Meghan Markle was thrown into the spotlight in 2017 after her whirlwind romance with Prince Harry took center stage. Their incredible journey has been filled with highs and lows. And now as we enter 2023, her story takes even more unexpected twists and turns. There is perhaps a fear that out of sight means out of mind. There's a misconception that because I have worked in the entertainment industry that this would be something I would be familiar with. But even though I'd been on my show for, I guess, six years at that point, I've never been part of tabloid culture. I've never been in pop culture to that degree. Falling in and out of favor with the press and public alike, Megan has proven to divide the opinions of royal followers around the world. For some reason, they feel very wronged, which I'm looking forward to finding out why. But they can't ask for privacy when they've made the Netflix series. It's opening up a can of worms. We were introduced actually by a mutual friend. It was, it was literally, it was through her and then we met once and then twice back to back, two dates in London mm. um, last July. Yes. Beginning of July. They had their first date at Soho House in London in 2016. And then of course, you know, with Meghan living and working at the time in Toronto and Canada, where she was filming Suits, and Harry being based in, in London, they realized they would have to really go out their way to make time for each other very quickly. So within a few weeks of that first date, they were on holiday together in Botswana. After avoiding the spotlight for so long, the pair made their first public appearance at the 2017 Invictus Games in Toronto, showing public displays of affection as they sat in the front row to watch wheelchair tennis. I think Meghan um, had quite a, a difficult initial period um, after their relationship was confirmed. And we know this because Harry issued a statement uh, defending her and sort of warning people off. Um, you know, she described it as disheartening and discriminatory. Um, but Harry himself uh, mentioned sort of racial undertones, which is pretty upsetting uh, for anyone concerned. Um, and I think, you know, it is a difficult situation when you are thrust into the into the glare of media interest, the, the royal family garner a huge amount of attention. And, um, you know, we know that they're not necessarily delighted by it, but, you know, they work closely with the media to get their messages across. Um, but I think nothing prepared Harry and Meghan for the wave of interest that followed the announcement of their relationship. Um, and in fact, it was Harry's statement that confirmed they were a couple. Uh, for the first time. I, I think it's a really difficult one because they are going to have to get used to the scrutiny, um, but it's only right that she's treated fairly. And um, I think it was upsetting for everyone to see that she'd been, you know, caused problems by this coverage. It was then confirmed by Kensington Palace that Meghan Markle and Prince Harry were engaged Whilst most people get parental permission to marry their significant other, Prince Harry had another person to please before walking down the aisle. In a letter to the Privy Council advisors, the Queen expressed her wedding well wishes to Meghan and Harry, giving them the royal seal of approval. And Buckingham Palace issued a statement saying, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh are delighted for the couple and wish them every happiness. And the engagement has the approval of her future father-in-law. No, we're thrilled, thank you very much, to both of them. I hope they'll be very happy indeed. It's a standard, typical night it's for us. It's a cosy us. night. It was, what were we doing? Just roasting chicken roasting and having... Chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. And it was just, a, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. 
He got on one knee. <laughs> of course. Is it an instant yes from you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I was yeah. like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. She said, can I say yes? Can I say yes? And then, then there was hugs, and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? And she goes, oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> so no, it was, um, it was a really nice moment. It was just the two of us. And um, I think I managed to catch, catch her by surprise as well. So. Yeah. There's a misconception that because I have worked in the entertainment industry that this would be something I would be familiar with. But even though I'd been on my show for, I guess, six years at that point, and working before that, I've never been part of tabloid culture. I've never been in pop culture to that degree and, and lived a relatively quiet life, even though I focused so much on my job. And um, so that was a really stark mm. difference out of the gate. But, um, and I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that I made the choice to not read anything, positive or negative. It just didn't make sense. And instead we focused all of our energies just on nurturing our relationship. On us, yeah. On us. There is no doubt that when anybody marries into the royal family, the media immediately start looking into the background and the family of that person. I mean, with, with Meghan, it was quite easy because she'd been very public on social media and on the internet. She'd spoken about her um, biracial background, the fact that her ancestors were slaves. She'd spoken extensively about her charity work as well. So we had a really quite graphic picture of the type of woman she was, a feminist, somebody who believed in speaking out about her mixed race background. And I think that all of this actually was positive, in my opinion, because it gave the media a platform which they could base their stories. Meghan Markle is a California girl. In fact, her dad, Thomas, uh, was in the film industry. He worked on set. And one of Meghan's earliest memories, actually, and what she says inspired her to be an actress, was being on set of the show Married with Children, a show that her dad worked on for years as a lighting director, I believe. Meghan grew up very much, um, not so much in the industry, but close, kind of on the periphery of show business. I think she got a real taste of it from a very early age. And Megan was always a natural performer. We've seen videos of her in school plays. We know that she was always um, kind of gravitating towards the stage and being on stage. Megan seemed to do really well with um, the kind of attention and, and scrutiny that came with being an actress. And there's no doubt that really from an early age, Megan always kind of stood out uh, from the rest of her peers. But now that it is all official, Prince Harry, do you have that sense that the combination of the two of you, your different backgrounds, that you together represent something new for the royal family? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's something new. I think it's, um, you know, it's a, for me, it's a, an added member of the family. It's, a, it's, a, it's another, another team player as part of the, the bigger team. And, you know, for all of us, all we want to do is be able to carry out um, the right engagements, carry out our work and try and encourage others and the younger generation to be able to see the, the world in the, in the correct sense rather than um, perhaps being dis having a, a distorted view. So, you know, the fact that I, the fact that I fell in love with Megan so incredibly quickly was a, was a sort of confirmation to me that, that everything, everything, all the stars were aligned, everything was just perfect. It was this beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life. I <laughs> fell into her life and the fact that she, I, I know the fact that she'll be really unbelievably good at the job part of it as well um, is obviously a huge, huge relief to me because she'll be able to deal with, with everything else that comes with it. But um, no, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a fantastic team. We know we are and, and we'll, we, we hope to, you know, over time, try and have as much impact for all the things that we care about as, as much as possible. I am very excited about that, yeah. Meghan and Harry said I do at Windsor's St. George's Chapel in front of 600 guests and millions of viewers in one of the world's most anticipated weddings.
Everyone was excited. The crowds were enormous. As you as you came up that very famous park, um, it was mobbed. I mean, both sides of where their carriage was going to go was was thousands and thousands of people stood back to back, ready to cheer them on. The applause, the cheers as they drove through Windsor were deafening. There was a tremendous amount of love and support for Meghan and Harry on their special day. With her new title as Duchess of Sussex, Meghan didn't waste any time settling right into the family. On July 10th, just two months after they tied the knot, Harry and Meghan appeared on the balcony of Buckingham Palace alongside Her Majesty the Queen and other members of the royal family. The family were joining in the celebrations for a historic flyover to mark the landmark 100th anniversary of the Royal Air Force. On July 13th, Duchess Meghan joined Duchess Kate in a joint appearance at the annual summer tennis event, Wimbledon. The royal ladies looked happy together on their first public outing without their husbands. A royal schedule is busy, and Meghan found that out fast. Later that month, she cheered on Prince Harry in a charity polo cup supporting Centibali. On September 12, 2018, the Duchess of Sussex launched a new SmartWorks capsule collection in London on the rooftop of Oxford Street's John Lewis department store. One of the most critical roles for a royal family member is the charities and causes they choose to support and the significant work they do for those causes. On June 14, 2017, England saw its worst post-war fire at Grenfell Tower. The avoidable tragedy cost 72 lives and devastated the lives of residents and the local community. Meghan Markle supported those affected and began to cook regularly with residents of the local Hub Community Kitchen. After cooking with the women since January of that year, she decided to create a project called Together a cookbook which showcases recipes from those families affected by the Grenfell fire. Megan described the book as a labor of love. In January 2018, as I was settling into my new home of London, I met a group of women whose community had been affected by the Grenfell fire. They had decided to get together to cook fresh food for their families and their neighbors. After the fire, it was somewhere where they could make food to take back to a hotel room where you don't have facilities to cook. It was sort of comforting to be able to do that, and, and the kitchen gave them the opportunity to do it. It was quite nice to have that sense of belonging. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Can you hear me all right? Yes, great. Um, thank you for coming for the launch of Together to celebrate this and the women of the Hub Community Kitchen. <laughs> Working on this project for the past nine months has been a tremendous labor of love. I had just recently moved to London and I felt so immediately embraced by the women in the kitchen, your warmth and your kindness 
and also to be able to be in this city and to see in this one small room how multicultural it was. On a personal level, I feel so proud to live in a city that can have so much diversity. It's 12 countries represented in this one group of women. It's pretty outstanding. I um, said in the foreword that this is more than a cookbook. And what I mean by that is the power of food is more than just the meal itself. It is the story behind it. And when you get to know the story of the recipe, you get to know the person behind it. And that's what we're talking about in terms of coming together to really engage and talk and to be able to celebrate what connects us rather than what divides us. That, I believe, is the ethos of together. So to the women of the Hub Community Kitchen, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this adventure with you. I'm so privileged to know you. I'm so excited to see the projects you're going to continue to do in your own community, the community at large, and also how you're going to inspire people globally by sharing your stories and your recipes. It's so impactful. We can see just in a few days alone, and the book's not even out yet, what you've been able to do. That's a testament to what this means to people, and I'm so proud of you. Um, so on that note, I know some of you started eating as you should. I'd be the last one to want the food to get cold. Um, so please enjoy a beautiful lunch. Another round of applause for the women of the Hub Community Kitchen, and cheers to you together. On September 25th, Megan made her first official solo appearance, celebrating the opening of Oceana, an art exhibit featuring 500 years of historical works. She entered full of confidence and looked flawless in Givenchy. On October 15th, 2018, the happy couple announced that they were expecting a baby in the spring of 2019. The announcement surprised the world, and many sent their congratulations and best wishes via social media, including the Archbishop of Canterbury. Doria Ragland, Megan's mother, expressed her happiness and said she was looking forward to welcoming her first grandchild. Despite the news of a royal addition, the Sussexes arrived in Sydney, Australia to begin the 16-day trip that would take them across the outback and to Fiji, Tonga, and New Zealand. The couple were met by a vast media crowd that never seemed to leave their side. This was their first official royal tour, and the schedule was jam-packed with over 70 engagements. The couple followed in the footsteps of Prince Charles and Diana, Princess of Wales, whose first royal tour was also to Australia and New Zealand. Meghan seemed in her element, chatting with the crowds, full of smiles and laughter. Meghan Markle made a speech at the celebration of 125 years of women's suffrage in New Zealand. Not long after their wedding, in fact, uh, their first official royal tour was that Meghan and Harry went off to Fiji, Tonga, and New Zealand together. It was like 16 days. This was a big deal. This was the first time that Meghan and Harry were going to represent the monarchy and the British uh, people abroad in the Commonwealth. Uh, I'm sure Meghan spent an awful lot of time figuring out her clothes, knowing she would be scrutinized at every minute, uh, as well as planning speeches, remarks, memorizing the names of the people they'd be meeting uh, and their advisors. It was it would have been a lot of homework. In fact, we very famously see Meghan getting off the plane when she arrives at the very beginning of a royal tour, carrying a big binder uh, of notes. Um, now, interestingly, she ho held it in front of her stomach for a reason. But you see, Meghan was already pregnant on that trip and they hadn't announced it yet. But clutching her research and her notes in front of her um, enabled her to kind of hide the beginnings of her baby bump. Having said that, um, it was obvious Meghan had been researching and reading up on the plane. You know, Meghan Markle is not someone who just wants a pretty designer dress and, and a glass of champagne. She is actually engaged and interested in the 
the politics and the storylines of where they're going. In fact, she got in trouble uh, not that long ago when she met someone in Ireland who was in Parliament, I believe, and congratulated them on the defeat of a bill that would have uh, nullified abortion in Ireland and said, you know, that's great, and ended up getting in trouble because the, the Irish politician tweeted, oh, I had this great conversation with Megan, and she congratulated us on the defeat of this um, initiative. And everybody was like, you can't take a side, Megan. You can't defend any position. I think, in all honesty, one of the most difficult, challenging things for this whole, in this whole experience for Megan, is the royal tradition of not taking a side. Uh, yes, um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Megan and myself had a baby boy um, early this morning, a very healthy boy. Um, mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience <laughs> I can ever um, possibly imagine. I haven't been at many births. Um, <laughs> this is definitely my first birth. Uh, it was amazing, absolutely incredible. And as I said, I'm so incredibly proud of my wife. Um, and as every father and parent would ever say, you know, your, your baby is absolutely amazing, but this little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for. So I'm just over the moon. On May 6th, 2019, Megan and Harry became a mother and father. Archie Harrison Mountbatten-Windsor was born at 5.26 a.m. at the Portland Hospital in London. Archie is now seventh in the line of succession to the British throne and is a citizen of both the United Kingdom and the United States. He was baptized wearing the royal christening gown by the Archbishop of Canterbury on July 6, 2019 in the private chapel of Windsor Castle. It's just been the dream, so it's been a special couple of days. Who does he take after? Does he look like anyone? We still can not figure that out. Well, everyone says the baby's changed so much over two weeks. We're basically sort of monitoring how the, uh, how the changing process happens over this next month, really. <laughs> but he's changed, his looks are changing every single day. Yeah. So who knows? I mean, parenting is amazing. It's, it's only been, what, two and a half days, three days? Yeah. Um, but. We're just, we're just so thrilled to have, have our own little bundle of joy um, and be able to spend some precious times with him as he slowly, slowly starts to grow up. <laughs> He's already got a little bit of facial hair as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Guys, <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you all much. so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thank you, everybody, for all the well wishes and the kindness. Mm. It really just means so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for the support. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have undertaken a public relations blitz, most recently after they appeared in an honest primetime interview with Oprah Winfrey that drew millions of viewers. Look, they're clearly very unhappy with the royal existence that they have at the moment and, and the way that, uh, the way that their, their public life um, impinges on them. It's, it's something they clearly want to change. Many people will have sympathy with that. Um, it's, it's understandable. Um, the, the, the crux of the matter is you can't be half royal. You can be uh, part of the royal machine, you can accept the privileges that go with it, but also take the restrictions and, uh, and all, all that, and, and you, you, you live in a, in, a, in a sort of bubble, or you can um, stand back. I mean, the, the, the next generation of Dukes of Kent, Dukes of Gloucester, they're private citizens. No one would recognize right. them in the street. You can go down that route if you want. What you can't do is to be uh, a sort of transatlantic royals who drop in, do a bit of royal stuff, but then go off to do this sort of financial independence stuff in, in LA or Toronto, wherever it is. 
I think the whole plan that Harry and Meghan have is a really problematic one because they're talking about stepping back. They're talking, their critics would argue, about having their cake and eat it. They're talking about one day representing the Queen on a foreign tour to a, a, another country, on another day, say, in North America, earning serious money with some sort of endorsement of some sort of product. The, the risk is that those two things aren't compatible. The risk is that their pursuit of money will uh, tarnish the Windsor brand and tarnish the House of Windsor. I and mean, this is the real problem for the Queen and uh, Prince Charles. They are dealing with this as a grandmother and as a father on the one hand, and they're also dealing with it as the protector of a ancient dynasty. And we have seen that how as protectors of the ancient dynasty, when they need to, they act brutally, as they did with Prince Andrew when they removed him from public office. There may be a point that at some stage that the Queen, Charles and William believe that what Meghan and Harry are proposing is a threat to the institution of the British monarchy, then they will act. In the interview, the couple discussed mental health issues and the Duchess said that she had suicidal thoughts after marrying into the British royal family. Some viewers noticed a strong resemblance to the interview Harry's mother, Diana, did in 1995. Uh, I think there is now uh, an allegation of racism hanging over a member or members of the royal family. We don't know who, as we said earlier, not the Queen, not the Duke of Edinburgh, but beyond that, we don't know who Harry and Meghan uh, wouldn't say. And nor do we know the context in which this remark was made, but we do know, from what we've heard, that both Harry, when he heard it, and Meghan, when it was passed on, took offence to it, and therefore that is an issue uh, for them. And also, I think there's slightly wider questions for us as society. Harry said that he left in part because of racism uh, in the UK. What does that mean for us? Do we need to look at ourselves a bit more? And I think then on the general point for, for Buckingham Palace, why is it that you know, Meghan was unable to sort of fit in? Why couldn't she get the help she needed when she desperately needed it? Although I should also point out, last week, there was that bullying complaint revealed against Meghan that the Human Resources Department had to look into as well. So there's a lot there. During the interview, which was filmed in Santa Barbara County, California, Prince Harry and Meghan announced their decision to step down as working members of the British royal family in January 2020. Interview topics included their courtship, wedding, sex of their second child, Meghan's suicidal thoughts, and a shared feeling of abandonment regarding financial and emotional support. Harry's estrangement from his father, Prince Charles, and brother, Prince William, was also discussed, as well as a royal title for Archie. The relationship between Meghan and her estranged family was briefly discussed as well. In addition to generating a lot of media attention, the interview received a mixed reaction from political figures. In December 2020, Meghan and Harry signed a multi-year deal with Spotify to produce and host their own programs through their audio producing company, Archwell Audio. On June 4th, 2021, Meghan and Harry announced the birth of their second child, Lilibet Diana Mountbatten Windsor. A sweet tribute to two significant people. Lily is named after her great-grandmother, the late Queen Elizabeth II, whose family nickname is Lilibet. Her middle name, Diana, is a tribute to Prince Harry's late mother, Princess Diana. In June 2021, Meghan Markle published her first children's book, The Bench. The book started as a poem Meghan wrote for Prince Harry for Father's Day about his relationship with their son, Archie, and was later turned into a full-fledged children's book. Archwell Incorporated is a nonprofit foundation for change founded by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex as the first step toward independence. Archwell Productions was founded by the couple who signed massive media deals with Netflix and Spotify for a series of inspiring documentaries and podcasts reportedly worth around 18 million pounds. 
Two years after Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stepped back as senior members of the royal family, the couple returned to the UK for an exceptional reason. Meghan and Harry saw the Queen on a low-key visit before attending the 2022 Invictus Games in the Netherlands. The secret visit came almost a year after Prince Philip's funeral, which had been the last time Harry was believed to have reunited with the Queen and the extended royal family. On September 8, 2022, while Meghan and Harry were in London preparing to attend a charity event, Queen Elizabeth II died at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. On September 10th, 2022, the new Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, were joined by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at Windsor to view the tributes to the Queen and spent time talking to the crowds. It was the first time since March 2020 that the two couples had been seen together. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death. It was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course, it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we you know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when Diana died and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. The couple then went on to attend the late Queen's funeral with Harry marching behind the coffin along with his family.
In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition, together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. That was more than a promise. It was a profound personal commitment which defined her whole life. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. Alongside the personal grief that all my family are feeling, we also share with so many of you in the United Kingdom, in all the countries where the Queen was head of state. The truth was, I wasn't sure that I belonged. I was so nervous. Oh, I doubted myself and I wondered, I wondered if I was good enough to even be there, if what I was doing in the world, albeit important and meaningful as far as I saw it, was it deserving to have a seat at this table? But one young world saw in me what I wanted to see fully in myself. They saw in me, just as I see in you, the present and the future. I joined you in London in 2019, and by that point, it's fair to say, my life had changed rather significantly. I was now married, and I was now a mom. My worldview had expanded exponentially, seeing the global community through the eyes of my child. And I would ask, what is this world he would come to adopt? And what can we do, what can I do to make it better? I am thrilled that my husband is able to join me here this time. <laughs> be able to see and witness firsthand my respect for this organization, this incredible organization, and all that it provides as well as accomplishes. One Young World has been an integral part of my life for so many years before I met him. So to meet again here on UK soil with him by my side makes it all feel full circle. And just as a sidebar, earlier this afternoon, we sat down with a few of you delegates, and it was incredibly inspiring, the resounding themes that came up about representation, about inclusion, about access, and about trying to shift the global perspective for all of us as a global community to one of curiosity over criticism. My husband has long advocated for important and necessary impact in the world, focusing a huge part of his life's work on the youth. So for both of us, bearing witness to the power that you hold in your hands and the unbridled enthusiasm and energy that you have to see things come to fruition, it is just an absolute privilege. I'm incredibly humbled to not just stand before each of you, but to stand beside you. We often hear people say the time is now, but I'm going to double down on that by saying your time is now. The important work can't wait for tomorrow. And this week, the world is watching as you cement your place in history by showcasing the good that you are doing today in the present moment as we embrace the moment of now to create a better tomorrow. Despite the turbulent previous years, Megan has continued to take on new challenges. Megan's podcast, titled Archetypes, premiered in August 2022. 
December 2022 saw the launch of the highly controversial tell-all documentary series, Harry and Meghan, on streaming giant Netflix. If the trailers are anything to go by, the tone of it's going to be extremely uncomfortable for people on both sides of the Atlantic, and that's going to make family reconciliation even harder than it already is. You'll watch that series and think, the royal family need looking after, they've come out of it better, or you'll be on the side of Harry and Meghan and think, wow, they had to put up with a loss and I'm on their side. She's becoming a royal rock star. And then... Everything changed. There's a hierarchy of the family. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. There was a war against Meghan to suit other people's agendas. It's about hatred. It's about race. It's a dirty game. Pain and suffering of women marrying into this institution, this feeding frenzy. I realized they're never going to protect you. I was terrified. I didn't want history to repeat itself. This was their chance to tell their story in their own words sending worldwide media into a frenzy. The Sussex brand, both in the UK and America, uh, is being helped in one way uh, by this Netflix documentary series by bringing uh, the Sussexes back onto our radar screens, if not our TV screens. So uh, there is perhaps a fear that out of sight means out of mind. Uh, and by uh, uh, cooperating with Netflix on a documentary like this, it gets us all talking about them again, uh, and it keeps them uh, in the limelight, and it keeps their, their brand uh, of Harry and Meghan uh, alive. For some reason, they feel very wronged, which I'm looking forward to finding out why, but they can't ask for privacy when they've made the Netflix series because everyone now is opening up a can of worms. There's no going back. There is no going back. 